what would happen in a total grid down situation? This is a question that I got asked today within the private community, because each day I get messages there, I get questions, and they usually are investment based or, you know, they're financial. But this one was due to the flooding last week in the UK and became quite severe. Actually, some areas saw the heaviest flooding in a long time. So we'll touch upon that, but I want to bring in some real world examples. As you know, I'm not a, you know, a prepping channel here, so I'm not going to give you an extreme example of a, a government takeover or some sort of technology that eliminates electricity or, you, you know, something like that. I just want to give you some real world um, scenarios and examples here because this does actually occur regularly, whether we look at Texas when the cold snap occurred, uh, those freezing temperatures, whether it's flooding in the UK, whether it's load shedding in South Africa, this sort of stuff is very common. So what I did was I typed out the answer um, to this person's question today. And I thought, you know what, a lot of other people would be really interested in that. So that's what we're going to look at today. So I want to take a hypothetical example and let's begin with Texas because a lot of Americans watching will remember what happened in 2021 where there was that severe grid failure due to a winter storm. Texas hit hard by a massive storm, four inches on the ground in Amarillo. While in Galveston, the storm brought heavy rain to the coastal city, flooding streets. And I think what surprised and shocked a lot of people was that Texas just wasn't geared towards or ready for a winter storm of that magnitude. Because what actually happened was people started to turn on their um, heating, the electricity, they would ramp it up. So the load that came back onto the grid was far too high and it resulted in a lot of blackouts. And for those of you that want the, the technical details around it, um, the statement says the grid frequency dangerously dropped below 59.4 hertz for over four minutes. If it had reached nine minutes, there would have been a total failure and the whole grid would have shut down. Fortunately, this was narrowly avoided. And the government actually released a statement saying this was one of the most deadly and most expensive disasters in Texas history. And this was because they just weren't geared towards, no one had actually, because what do government do? They are reactive, they are not proactive. So no one ever thought, well, what would happen if we had this severe winter storm where temperatures plummeted and the base load on the grid was ramped up because everyone had to run their heating and their systems a lot harder in order to just get heat into the home, which is exactly what happened. Now, if you're like me, you've probably experienced power outages in the past. I haven't experienced as many um, as I get older, especially in the region that I live in. But I remember when I was younger in the UK, we would have power cuts all the time. And I do mean all the time. This was a regular occurrence. It was it was normal. Sometimes I would wake up in my bedroom and I wasn't hearing the humming sound or I wasn't hearing certain sounds that I would normally hear. I'd look out the window and all the street lights were off. There, there were no lights anywhere. But this was usually cleared up within an hour or two and it wasn't really a big deal. One of the issues was that when the power goes out, so does the heating, the heating goes out, the sewage goes out, but it usually occurred in a, a small area. It wasn't everywhere all at once. But if you look at the, I, I downloaded some of the schematics and information from the power grid here, and it says that it's designed to be largely interconnected, which allows for fail safes. Should one part fail, the rest is unaffected. This design allows for multiple paths to the same destination and for the producers and sources of power to be spread out so they are unlikely to all be knocked offline at exactly the same time. The problem would be if there was a, a major blackout. And this is what concerns me as well about this uh, rapid transition to the green energy movement. We've talked about this a lot. We've done a lot of, we've read a lot of studies and reports on this. And you have a lot of scientists who say that this transition is far too quick. Well, you have a lot of 
scientists who say the whole thing is nonsense in the first place. You then have all these scientists on the other side who say, oh no, we have to get this temperature down 1.5 degrees by 2027, or that is it, the, you know, the whole world is going to end. And it's one of these topics you can't even discuss anymore. If you try and have a, you know, a rational discussion with someone about it, like myself, I like to get as much information as possible. I never just like to jump to a conclusion on anything. I like to speak to people on both sides, unbiased opinions. Often when someone is paid to give an opinion, it's very hard to take that opinion seriously. But when someone doesn't have any bias in a situation, it's a lot better to discuss and get information from that person because you know it's coming from an unbiased source. Now, linking this back to what I'm referring to here, if the grid does go down completely and we have a massive failure, I was reading some of these reports about what could happen here. It is very, very difficult to get the, the system back online. It's not just like, you know, flicking a light switch where you, you know, the light goes on, you flick it, the light goes off. No, the, the system is very, very complex. And this is why some of those initial plans were laughed at by engineers and, and scientists around being, some cities said they would be 100% renewable energy. They wouldn't have any coal-fired electricity or, or, or other plants at all. It'd be 100% run on uh, wind turbines, uh, solar panels, and you know a couple of other things. And I'm not an expert on this, so I didn't know either. But when I started looking at it, I, I realized the absurdity of what all these other people were saying, is that you have to have idling power. You have to have something that will take the base load. You can't have solar panels and wind turbines taking the, the base load. It just doesn't work like that. So let's say that everything was 100% uh, renewable, for example, or we did have one of these blackouts and they just couldn't get the, the grid restarted. Well, what would happen? You, you think logically what most people would do, and we talked about that movie recently, the, the one that the Obamas uh, produced, a bit, a bit of a weird one. We covered that video um, two or three weeks ago on the channel. But what did people do? They would pick up their, their phone. You know, that's the first thing people did. They picked up their, their phone. They're trying to get some sort of service. They're trying to reach out to other people and communicate with people. That's one of the first things that people do. Well, that most probably wouldn't work because the, the network would be down. It relies on electricity and you just wouldn't be able to communicate with people. You might not even be able to get the news. But getting the news would be the least of your worries. Trust me on this. You would be more concerned with, well, let's say it was uh, in, in the summer, for example. Well, if it's in the, the winter, your biggest concern would be staying warm. A lot of people uh, are simply not prepared these days for when temperatures drop um, quite low, sometimes below freezing in a lot of countries. But if it was in the summer, you might get um, too hot or the food in your fridge or your freezer w would spoil very quickly, especially if you were to open the door. What about running water and, and sewage? One of the things that um, is a problem at the moment with the UK with all the flooding last week was all the raw sewage that was just dumped into all the rivers. Your plumbing in your you know, sewage facilities in your home simply wouldn't work. But at this stage, it still wouldn't be a severe uh, situation for you. It's, it's not life-threatening. It's only a little bit later on. This is why we often talk on this channel about preparation on the channel as well. Everything from the very simple and obvious things like having an emergency fund right the way through to having some emergency preparedness supplies. And I always get, you know, comments about this and, oh, you know, you're paranoid and you know this sort of thing. But I think it's often because those people usually live in high rise apartments in big cities and they don't think anything will ever happen. But other people who live more rurally, maybe in the USA or, or Canada or somewhere like that, or maybe the UK or Europe where you live a lot more rurally, those people usually understand and say, yes, Neil, I've got, you know, I've got these supplies. We've had this situation. We've been snowed in. So someone once said, I was snowed in for two weeks and I couldn't get to the store. And that's why I have emergency food and, and water and, and things like this. And I shared with you um, several years ago now how when I was in the military, I used to go to a lot of different countries. I visited over 70 countries now in my life. And I've actually seen firsthand when things go bad, when things really break down. This can be for all sorts of reasons. Once it was due to an election, I was in 
well, I won't say which country it was, but it was in Africa. There was some big elections and oh, the whole law and order just completely broke down. And within about two days, I would say, maybe even 24 hours, there was nothing in the stores. There was no food anywhere. There was mass looting and there was all sorts of issues. Now, you might say, oh, Neil, that's Africa, you know. But actually, you think about the US, you think about the UK, you think about France and Germany or, or uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, wherever you're watching from. This could happen to you as well especially if you live in that apartment in the big high rise in the city. People don't tend to have the same mindset as people who live a lot more rurally. Because believe me, within a few days or even a week, if it took a long time to get the grid back online. And again, this is where people say, oh, well, it wouldn't take that long. Really, have you heard of solar flares? Solar flares erupt outwards into space at up to four and a half million miles an hour releasing massive amounts of energy. Because we're actually due another solar flare at some point now. It was, I think it's 18, it's something like 1859. I'll, I'll, I'll grab the date in a moment since the last one. So we are due another one. In August of 1859, something incredible happened in the skies that captivated astronomers worldwide. While sketching sunspots on September 1st, was momentarily blinded by an intense flash. It was so bright that he initially thought something had damaged his observation equipment. Normally, it takes days for a corona mass ejection to reach Earth, but this one took a mere 17 and a half hours to traverse the vast expanse between the Sun and our planet. A geomagnetic storm ensued. The beauty in the sky concealed a disruptive force. Electrical systems across Europe and North America faltered. This event, famously termed the Carrington Event, unleashed energy equivalent to 10 billion megatons of TNT from the Sun. Scientists warned that if such an event were to happen today, it could lead to an internet apocalypse. But what do you think would happen to all, all these households when they run out of food or when, when they run out of water or the water isn't even working because the electricity's down or there's problems with raw sewage and you know all sorts of other things like that but you know there's a, the expression people are only three meals away from chaos and i have seen that firsthand multiple times in my military service so take it from me this can actually happen Indian astronomers have just warned that the coming solar storm could be so powerful that the internet across the world could face problems for weeks. We may have to be a little serious about upcoming solar flares. Unfortunately, this isn't the plot of an underappreciated B-tier Netflix thriller, but an actual possibility according to scientists who have been studying the sun's solar activity. A new study reveals that this solar maximum is coming sooner than expected, most likely in early 2024. The middle of the solar cycle is the solar maximum, or when the sun has the most sunspots. As the cycle ends, it fades back to the solar minimum, and then a new cycle begins. Indian astronomers found that the next solar maximum is likely to occur not in 2025 but in early 2024 with flames so strong that they can disrupt the world's internet for weeks. And I know that I've got around 5-6% to 6 of South African subscribers. In fact, where I live on the Isle of Man, there is a very large South African population. I have a lot of South African friends. And some of the stories that they shared with me, because I noticed they would always have food, they would always, always have emergency water supplies and uh, fuel and all sorts of things. And I thought that was quite interesting when I saw that same pattern at three or four of their houses. And then they would share with me about load shedding. So if you're South African, drop a comment below, because you've obviously been through all of this and you are going through it. In fact, the data that I pulled up earlier today shows that in 2023, South Africa was without power electricity for 19.9% of the time throughout the year. So let's just call that 20%. That means if you look at it on a you know day by day basis, one in every five days, there is no power. And I've actually got the stats here. It says um, South Africans started 2024 with the return of load shedding 
ending an 18-day streak of no blackouts. In 2023, South Africans faced 72.6 days of power outages. That's double that of 2022 and nearly 10 times that of 2021. So what they're saying is that the situation is getting worse. And I've read dozens and dozens and dozens of these articles. I find them quite interesting, actually. Uh, one that caught my attention was this car factory is required to wait until 2037 for grid connection because there's such a big backlog. 2037. The UK is the longest queue for electricity grid connections in Europe. There is currently around 200 gigawatts of electricity projects, enough to power 150 million homes are still waiting for grid connections. And it can be up to five or six years before some of them are even connected. And it's not just the UK, it's also the US and a lot of other European countries. They're simply not ready for this uh, renewable connection to the grid. So they've been pushing, pushing, pushing to get it all going and now they're not prepared for it. It's just very, very reactive instead of being proactive. And coming back to this question then, I was even reading the blog of an astrophysicist today, which was uh, you know, a little bit way over my head. Let's just, uh, let's just throw that out there. But one thing I didn't know, because part of the question I was asked was about solar flares and other things uh, around the grid down situation. One thing I didn't know was that it's not the solar flare itself that causes all the electrical components to fail. It's the geomagnetic storm. So I learned something new today. And he says that this is similar to an EMP weapon, so an electromagnetic pulse weapon, although the emitted frequencies are much lower. This typically causes power surges in electrical grids or long wires. The power surges destroy transformers, and this happened in Canada not too many years ago. But he said the biggest issue is the satellites, because the, unless they're shut down beforehand, which they won't be because no one will know that this is coming, then the satellites will be rendered useless and there isn't really a way to repair them. He also said that the biggest problem will be the production of new transformers because the production of these things is just nowhere near what it would need to be, even if you ramped it up. He said it would take many years, anywhere from five to 10 years, before the electricity would be brought back online for uh, many regions. I mean, to me, this is mind boggling. Um, so he focused on how the US would, and rich countries would get all the transformers first, but a lot of African or Southeast Asian uh, countries would be waiting five to 10 years. I'm not so sure about the Southeast Asian countries. As you know, I'm in Southeast Asia at the moment. A lot of people don't quite grasp just how advanced they are over here now. These are not the same developing nations that many of you will remember from 20 or 30 years ago, like I do. Now they are very, very advanced, especially in the big, uh, the big capital cities. So overall, I do think it's just a matter of time until we do have some sort of a, a large scale incident, regardless of country. So whether that is something like mass flooding, which we, we, we've seen at the moment, whether it is these extreme winter storms or whether it is a solar flare that is bound to happen at some point, this will actually occur. This isn't an alarmist video, as sometimes people often say. This is factual. This will happen at some point in the future. So I hope that what I've said today and shared with you will help you in some way just to prepare should this ever happen where you live. So thank you so much for watching today. I really appreciate it. Uh, take care, God bless, and I'll see you on the next video.